Welcome. Um, my name is Rob Montgomery. I'm one of the uh, local systems engineers for Brocade Communications. Um, basically, I'm you know part of the out of the Boston metro territory. So, if you guys ever work with Brocade, especially on the IP side, because that's where I play, there's you know three or four guys just like me, but you might wind up dealing with me as well. What we're going to talk about really quickly here is uh, kind of go over um, the virtualized data center and what it is that we need to do to make the network kind of virtualization friendly in a data center type environment. Virtualization brings with it a number of different changes. Well, there's a lot of things that we need to think about that maybe are or are, may not be quite so obvious to us. Okay. Before I get going too far, I do want to point out that a couple of things that we're going to talk about today are going to be a little bit forward looking. Uh, we're going to talk about products that are in the process of coming out. And so what I don't want to do is I don't want to go ahead and uh, you know, give you guys any misconceptions that if I, you know, I guarantee you, first of all, I'm going to misspeak at some point. And secondly, that, you know, things that I talk about may, you know, obviously change. You know, so please don't take any of that stuff as being absolutely carved in stone. Just, 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 just help me out on that one. Um, are you guys familiar with Brocade? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, just really quickly, just, you know, just kind of quickly go through, you know, who it is. And this is somewhat germane to what we're going to talk about but kind of, kind of where the company comes from itself. We were born from Brocade, legacy Brocade. Brocade was you know, founded in 1995, one of the largest fiber channel operations out there. Um, as is obvious, everything will eventually, you know, it's kind of like the truism of these days, everything's eventually going to run over Ethernet, everything's eventually going to run over IP. Um, and so it made sense about four years ago, Brocade went out there and acquired Foundry Communications, right? Foundry being one of the... Um, you know, kind of the leaders in the price performance kind of side of this segment. A lot of very interesting technology, a lot of very interesting capabilities in, in Foundry Gear. And so what's happened is after the merger worked, we went out and we built ourselves a whole new data center. I mean, not a whole new data center, a whole new, uh, you know, headquarters. And what we've come to is we've come to the point where we have, you know, IP engineers and fiber channel engineers sitting in the same facility. And there's starting to see some dialogue going on between the two. Right. I can only imagine, because I'm not a fiber channel guy, but I'm pretty sure there's technology that we have in the IP space that's migrating over towards the uh, fiber channel space. What we're definitely seeing is we're seeing a lot of stuff coming the other way. Right. And this is becoming very handy for us as we move into taking care of what's happening in the uh, you know, virtualized data center. The other thing I like to point out is we're a $2.5 billion company. Right? It's a pretty good sized company, 4,000 employees, you know, we're doing well, we're making money, everything's, you know, everything's chugging right along. Um, that's the good news. Obviously, there are certain competitors in this space for whom two and a half million, you know, excuse me, two and a half billion dollars would be, you know, walking around money. Um, we're not all things to all people. Where we don't have, you know, we're, we're not out there building our own hypervisor. We're not out there building servers. We're not out there building firewalls. We're not out there building, you know, storage arrays and so on and so forth. What we are is we're a specialist, right? We're a specialist organization. We specialize in a pretty big segment, which is networking, right? And you're gonna, we're going to touch on a few of the different products that we have based around networking. Um, but what we also do is we go out there and we start working with other companies, right? We work with partners in all these different spaces. So when it comes to the hypervisor, we're going to talk a lot about VMware because this is obviously, you know, VMware's users group. Um, but same kind of thing as far as Microsoft Hyper-V, as far as Citrix Zen, as far as, you know, Oracle and so on and so forth. We're out there working with these organizations, making sure that stuff that we do interoperates well, right? Same thing on the server side of the house, same thing in the security side of the house, same thing on the storage side of the house, right? And so this becomes a part of a kind of a, a, a you get to build the infrastructure that you want. But at the same time, you already know that the infrastructure has been, you know, somewhat or entirely vetted. Um, because we've gone in there and worked with these people, you know, quite, quote, quite closely. All right. So what's so special about a data center, right? Well, if we take a look at this, all right, this is like our, our classic data center. This is, you know, pre-virtualization. Every, you know, we had, we had real servers in this, how old fashioned, have real servers, right? But what we have is we've got a number of different racks, right? You might have the, and, and what we noticed was that applications tended to wind up local to a rack or a set of racks. Right? So in this case here, we've got you know, a couple of top of rack switches, and in this rack, maybe we've got the web servers, and in this rack, we've got file servers, and in this rack, we've, I just kind of made these up, right? These are kind of classic definitions, D database servers, mail servers, and then all the other stuff that happens, right? You know, maybe it's 
voice gateways, maybe it's, you know, DNS servers, who knows. Um, right now, somewhere between 75 to 85 percent, depending on who you ask, of traffic will typically stay local to a data center, right? You think about the classic case of, you know, your, your, your web front end, right? Well, that, everybody thinks about the traffic that goes to the web server from the client. But at the end of the day is, that web server is probably talking to a database. That we have storage traffic, storage going on. We have, um, you know, backups going on. We have replication going on. We, there's a lot of stuff happening internal to the data center. In the old days, it was pretty straightforward. Generally speaking, obviously there's exceptions to every rule, but generally speaking, you know, where, where I had a number of database servers, a lot of that inner server traffic was just going up and down the rack, right? Everybody was one hop from everybody else. You just bounce off the top of rack switch and life is fine. There wasn't, most of the traffic that was actually heading back up towards the core, right, was actually destined to leave the data center, right? Or at least, you know, a sizable percentage of that. Well, here's what's happening is we've gone ahead and we've changed everything, right? And maybe when I first deployed it, I had all my web traffic over here, all my, all my uh, email servers over here and database servers and file servers and just like it used to be. But one of the neat things about a virtual machine is I can move it. And there's lots of different reasons I might want to move a virtual machine. And I'm more li most likely going to put that virtual machine where I don't have a lot of utilization, right? Which means chaos theory kicks in over time, I'm going to wind up with everything everywhere, right? It's going to look like a six-year-old's room. Um, this changes our traffic patterns quite a bit, okay? And what it's going to do is, 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 is it's going to mean that instead of having traffic staying local to the rack or local to the, you know, the row, what I get is traffic can be going anywhere. And that's going to obviously do a couple of things to our network, right? Actually, it does about five things to our networks. First thing it's going to do, obviously, is it changes the traffic patterns, right? We've already covered that. But it has a side effect of network utilization climbing. Why does network utilization increase? Well, if you think about it, in the old days, everything was one hop away from everything else. Now, suddenly, if I'm bouncing up off that spine layer and going back down to, my, to the other server, right, I'm potentially three switch hops away, which means I'm now using four links where I used to be using two links. Obviously, there's a little bit more utilization happening, especially on those backbone links, right? Um, obviously, if I'm going three hops instead of one hop, latency is going to increase. Is latency important? Right? Well, it depends on your application, but generally speaking, yes, yeah, latency is becoming increasingly important in networks, right? The other thing is we see that we have increased number of switches. As we go through more and more infrastructure to get from point A to point B, what we're starting to see is we're seeing more and more opportunity for that infrastructure to fail. Right, the failure zone for a particular application is obviously going to increase. Likewise, the impact of an individual component failure, if a switch fails in the old days, it would really impact one application. Right now, if that switch fails, it could potentially in impact multiple or even all of my applications. And so that's a big change. Right? And then the final thing that we're seeing here is the idea of layer two domains. Um, it used to be we could have, you know, this is the web subnet and this is the mail subnet and so on and so forth. Well, now we still have that. We still have VLANs, but we're starting to see situations where we need to start dragging those VLANs everywhere in the data center and even potentially between data centers in order to facilitate the vMotion moves. Okay, we got some work to do. And that work is going to kind of come down to five things, right? First thing that it comes down to is network topology. Historically, we've always used a class fabric. Um, might be some better ways to do that, right? Redundancy. Obviously, we need to make sure that we're ready to handle any kind of failure that's going to happen inside of that network. That goes everywhere from having a host go down to having a switch go down to having a link go down to having the entire data center go down. Okay? Service scalability. And this is kind of a, this is where it gets a little bit strange because not only does this mean that we're, not only does virtualization mean that we're able to virtualize our data centers, it also means a lot of people are starting to outsource a lot of their data centers. Right? Within a data center, you know, the whole sales point of virtualization is that we're going to increase the reliability, you know, increase the, uh, the, 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 the cost benefit ratio, right? We're going to make it so that it costs less for us to do more because we're not going to be wasting all the resources. We can take that same resource and we can allocate it here today and there tomorrow and kind of smooth things out, optimize it. This is important inside of, you know, a company owned data center. It's really important if you start going, you know, to the cloud. 
right? If you start getting along with that rack space or Amazon or you know, any of these other infrastructure as a service type of providers, right? You're renting those VMs. You're paying by the hour or you're paying by the, you know, you're, you're, you're paying as you use those VMs. I wanna use the minimum number of VMs that I can get away with in order to achieve my goals without running the risk of not, not meeting my SLAs, right? Multi-tenancy, right? For those of us who own data centers, multi-tenancy is a key thing. Now, it comes in a couple different forms, right? Multi-tenancy can be, I'm a, you know, I'm a Rackspace or I'm a Amazon or somebody like that, and I've got, you know, 5,000 customers or 10,000 customers, and, you know, I got Coke, I got Pepsi, I, don't, I may have them on the same post, but I sure don't want those two servers talking to each other. I don't want there to be a back door to get from one to the other. Um, or it can be, I'm a f large corporation, or even I'm a medium-sized corporation. I may have different business units. I may have regulatory requirements why I've got to separate traffic and so on and so forth. And then the last thing we're gonna talk about is service velocity. And service velocity is one of those terms that it took me years to get a straightforward definition of what it actually means. It's really simple, right? It's how fast can I go from the customer calling me up saying I need to me actually having that thing up and running and the bill in the mail, <laughs> right? Um, service velocities in this industry have not historically been great. And so the question is, is how do we go ahead and, and speed that up? Because obviously the faster I can get that service deployed, the faster I can send the bill and the more money I'm gonna make out of that service, okay? All right, so let's start with network topology. Historically, this is the topology that everybody uses, right? Nice class architecture. I've got a couple of switches up in the spine. I've got a, you know edge switches down, down, and, and we did this for a reason. We did this for a couple of reasons. One, probably the biggest reason is it works, <laughs> right? It's a, it's a functional topology. There's no really, comp there was never really a compelling reason to change it. And then number two is, is it maps very nicely when you're talking about a layer two domain. It maps very nicely to a spanning tree type of architecture, right? What I've got, if I come over here, is I've got a root bridge, right? And then sitting right next to it, I've got a backup root bridge. And I can mix those up, right? This guy can be the root for some VLANs, that guy's the root for other VLANs, everybody's happy, right? And then traffic will tend to flow from switch to switch. It just bounces through whoever the root is for that particular VLAN. And we've, we're doing a nice job of adhering to that tree architecture, okay? The problem here is, how scalable is it, right? As we, start, we're, as we start moving into these virtualized environments, as those traffic patterns change that we talked about, we're starting to see more and more of a traffic hit on these spine switches, right? Well, there's an easy solution to this, right? More is better, right? Yeah, it works. Works to a point. But that still doesn't address the latency issues. Right? That still doesn't in, it address the failure domain issues. Right? There's, there's a number of other issues that we still haven't really addressed with this. Right? Maybe a mesh topology would be nice. And I'm kind of just, you know, bouncing around here, right? A mesh topology would be nice or a nice little four-dimensional hypercube. Wouldn't it be fun to tell all your buddies I got a four-dimensional hypercube in my data center? Right? Or hell, we could do a twisted torus. Right? More likely it's going to be something else. Right? The point is, is the optimal topology of your network is not necessarily going to be that rigid, you know, two layer or three layer class architecture that we've been living with for, you know, the last decade or two decades or however long it's been there, right? We need to be able to adjust those architectures to adjust to the needs of our network in terms of latency, in terms of reliability, and in terms of performance. All right. Easy way to get there. Ethernet fabrics, you guys have obviously, I mean, I can't imagine you haven't heard the term Ethernet fabric at some point, right? There's three or so vendors out there that do Ethernet fabrics. Obviously, that we're brocade. We have one of those solutions. We're going to talk about that solution, okay? Um, but it's actually a kind of a neat idea, right? The idea is, and, and, and I always get in trouble when I start talking this way, but the idea is how do we effectively route at layer two? You guys remember DECnet, specifically DECnet Phase 4? How's that for a Wayback Machine, right? If you remember DECnet, right, the routers knew about all the hosts, right? It knew that this host was over there. It knew that that host was over there. It's a pretty simple, if not very scalable, routing solution, right? And what we want to do is we want to kind of not necessarily do exactly the same thing, right? But we want to kind of hit the same kind of objectives, 
right? And so the idea here is what we're going to do is we're going to take our switches. Instead of having our switches just using a very simple spanning tree protocol, we're going to have them go ahead and actually use a link state algorithm to build adjacencies with each other and, and build that map of what the network looks like, right? And then what we do is we go ahead and on top of that, we're going to lay a naming service, right? I, I call it a distributed name service up here. It's really called the Ethernet name service. Really what that is is that's MAC addresses. Is if I'm a switch and I learn about a MAC address, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to advertise to all the other switches in the domain and say, hey, this MAC address lives here, right? And then now what I can do is as traffic flows through, if, if, I'm, if I'm sending a packet to a MAC address that lives on, on your switch, right? I'm going to say, okay, oh, that, that MAC lives on this particular switch. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a trill header on the front. And, you know, simplistically speaking, what that trill header includes is the MAC address of the switch on which the, because I don't want to have to redo that name server's lookup at every single hop, right? And so what I'm going to, so I'm going to be able to say, hey, send this packet to that switch. The last switch says, hey, that's my MAC address, rips the, rips the header off and delivers it to the, to the host, right? This is kind of cool. I do those, if I can do those three things, what I effectively get is the ability to build any topology that I want without the need to always call, go back to that tree-based topology, right? I'm no longer, you know, dealing with spanning tree. This also gives me a couple of other benefits. It allows, specifically, it allows for rapid failover, right? Because if you think about it, no longer am I waiting for a network-wide recomputation of my tree architecture in the event of a change, right? Everybody knows what the topology is. If I can say, hey, that link went away, everybody knows how to react to that. All I have to do is do a little bit of arithmetic, and now I've got the new, you know, it's pretty much as fast as I can detect the failure, I can recover from the failure. And oh, by the way, I can detect that failure pretty fast because that's going to be a, it's, it's a link-based event, right? It's, it's, it's do I have the connection between the two switches or do I have the connection to the host, right? Those are the kinds of things that we're dealing with. This also allows us to go ahead, and, and, and we're kind of getting beyond that initial, you know, technology here at this point, is we can start doing some fun things on top of this. This allows us to go ahead and build things like um, VLAGs. And what a VLAG is, is a, a VLAG is the ability to take a device, plug that device into the fabric, yet have, build a lag into the fabric, but have that lag terminate on multiple switches. I can terminate on up to four switches right now. So a couple, a couple of examples that we'll talk about, you know, I have a, if I have a server, right? That server, if I do a NIC team into my fabric, I can have two top rack switches that are sitting at the top of my rack. I can go in the ones, I can go in the other. Now if one of those top rack switches dies, who cares, right? We have another, another thing that I want to talk about quickly. And this is a, uh, a case of um, bandwidth, right? Especially in the back, one of the things that's going to happen here, right, is we see the increase in bandwidth, is we're going to have to provision an appropriate amount of bandwidth. Well, what happens if between two switches, I start exceeding the single link bandwidth requirements, right? If I, let's say I've got a 10 gigabit link between two switches, and all of a sudden I start driving that link at, you know, 80, 90% utilization, somebody's going to want to do something. What would we do? What would you guys do? Add another link? Yeah, so I build a lag, right? Right? Is that going to give me a huge performance increase? Not really, right? Because, because, because the, the problem with lag, and this is, I mean, this is, it's a problem with lags, right? The problem is, is that in TCP IP, when I'm sending traffic, right, theoretically, TCP will resequence packets at the other end. Right? So if I somehow another, if, I, if I, I've got a lag, right, and I send one packet down link A and I send another packet down link B, there's a chance that that lag is going to resequence those packets, right? It gets to the other end. Theoretically, TCP is going to look at that. Eh, yeah, okay, I'm going to hold on to that one, get the first one, send the first one up, then send the second one up. Life is good. Theoretically, it works. In practice, it's a huge performance hit. Right? And what the end result is, is if I'm doing this consistently, if I see a lot of resequencing going on in my communications, it's going to appear to the user and appear to the server as performance loss. Right? And we all know what happens when you get performance loss. Your phone starts ringing, the pager goes off, and yeah, nobody, nobody wants that. Right? 
So what, the way in which every vendor in the world gets around it is we use a hashing algorithm to decide what goes down each path. Because what I need to do is I need to make sure that for each flow, each conversation, each conversation goes down its own path, right? It goes down a single path, and so all the packets in that conversation stay in sequence. And there's all kinds of different ways in which there's different algorithms people use to associate them, you know, distribute traffic among the paths. There's different, you know, number, different vendors use different number of tuples to keep track of, you know, the different flows and seg separate this flow from that flow. We, we can go on for days about this. But what it boils down to is, is I'm really distributing flows, and not all flows are equal, right? Some flows are going to use a lot of bandwidth, right? They're going to be your heavy hitters. And some flows are going to be short-lived and kind of brief. Well, statistically speaking, it's not a long shot for you to wind up with kind of an imbalance of a few too many of the heavy hitters wind up on one link and not on the other link. And so what we wind up with is we wind up with, historically, I can get about 60% utilization reliably out of a lag, right? Well, if I figure that I was able to get, I don't know, 90% out of my single link, right, but I can only get 60% out of my two lengths, I'm seeing a very small incremental increase in bandwidth, right? And so that's something to think about. So what we, we did was we, we, this is where we stole technology from the Fiber Channel guys, right? Is we figured out that if you take a, a trunk and you go basically, you know, if you think about it from an ASIC to ASIC direction, you can keep track of the sequence in which things are placed into that you know, sprayed across a pair of links or three links or four links or five links or whatever, right? And in doing so, you can actually preserve the sequence of the packets without having to split them up based on hash value. Uh, kind of goofy, right? Works over short distances, works in, you know, in, in a controlled environment. Um, the end result is, is when I add that second link, instead of getting an incremental increase in bandwidth, pretty much double my bandwidth, right? We're seeing, we're, we're reliably seeing 95 plus or minus percent utilization across these brocade trunks in the lab, All right? And we're seeing that in reality too, okay? Um, so that's kind of neat. The other thing which we throw into this is we throw into this the concept of data center bridging. And what data center bridging allows us to do is it allows us to provide very un-Ethernet-like services, right? Things like fiber channel over Ethernet and iSCSI especially fiber channel over ethernet, are very sensitive to traffic loss, right? Are very sensitive to performance changes. And so what we're able to do is we're actually able to go in there and effectively reserve, tra reserve bandwidth through the system and communicate those reservations all the way from adapter to adapter to allow those guys to run in a, a lossless manner, right? We can basically guarantee lossless delivery of FCOE frames across a multi-hop ethernet network. Okay, and this is through enhanced transmission selection. This is through um, data center bridging exchange. This is through things like priority-based flow control and so on and so forth. I'm not going to go down that rat hole. We could spend all day talking about that, and this is already going to be boring enough as it is. So, and I managed to talk about the next four or five slides here without actually talking about them, <laughs> without actually flipping to them. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to kind of blast through these quite quickly. All right. Okay. So, any questions about topology? Right? The idea is we can do pretty much anything we want to do. The next level is redundancy. And when we look at redundancy, there's a bunch of different types of redundancy, right? We've got host level redundancy. What happens if a host fails? Sounds simple, right? vMotion takes over. Um, but from a network point of view, there's some very specific things that we need to think about. Okay? Um, Edge link redundancy, network link redundancy, switch redundancy, right? Obviously, if, if, if any of these, either of these links fails or if the switch fails, we have to worry about things. And probably the biggest thing these days, because it's still very much a, um, this is kind of new ground from a reliability point of view, is the whole concept of facility level redundancy, right? I had a case of, you know, almost 20 years ago now, where a uh, place I was working, we had the, you know, the guys who did the life safety stuff. Well, our data center was, you know, shall we say the fire suppression was water-based. And uh, so what you do is when the water base is in there, you put the little flow sensor into the, into the standpipes for the sprinkler system, right? And if that flow sensor goes off, you kill power to that data center. Well, about two days before the end of fiscal year, they decided to flush the sprinkler system and forgot to tell the IT department. This is a long time ago, but I'll tell you what, many computers, and they take a while to come back to life. 
right? That was a busy couple of days. Um, so, okay, so redundancy. Let's look at redundancy here, right? I got my nice little data center. I've got my three hosts. Each host is a couple of, you know, this is like your classic training, our training system here, right? What's gonna happen if, let's say, this host goes away? And I'm assuming that all your license fees are paid up with VMware. Okay, what happens? Yeah, hopefully vMotion kicks in, right? So I got my, these couple of VMs, right? One's gonna go one way, one's gonna go the other way, and they come back to life, right? And hopefully we have a very short outage, the customer doesn't notice, we meet our SLAs, everybody goes to bed on time. Make sense? There's a little network thing that didn't happen here, right? The, the, the assumption based on what happened is that I don't have a lot of networking configuration happening here. That theoretically, everybody's on the same VLAN or every VLAN goes everywhere and there's no real configurations. Reality says I'm probably doing three things for each one of these VMs. I'm probably associating them with a the VLAN, right? And that VLAN, I don't want every VLAN going everywhere. If I get into a sizable environment, right, it would be really nice if I didn't have all of my you know, data, database VLANs going to every single host in my entire data center just in case I might potentially need one, right? The second thing is gonna be quality of service. I may have quality of service configurations on these devices. I may be marking traffic. I may even be you know, using queuing algorithms, right? And then the third thing is gonna be security. I might have an access list. Right? They are IP based. Your IP doesn't change. Oh, well, I shouldn't say they're IP based. They're usually port based in a network. They're usually associated with a physical interface. But the virtual switch should move with it. Right. Right. And that's one of the solutions that you can do is you can try to push a lot of that stuff up into the virtual switch. Yeah. There's an easier solution. Right? Okay. The easier solution is something called automatic migration of port profiles. The idea here is that we take those, that port profile, there's three things, right? The VLAN, the QoS, and the, and, the, uh, um, and, and the security policy. And we go ahead and we associate that to a MAC address. Or more accurately, we associate the MAC address to the port profile. And then we set it up so wherever that MAC shows up inside of my, inside of my fabric, that configuration is just going to go ahead and follow it. Because the idea is we want to offload that hypervisor as much as, you know, that, that, that switch as much as we possibly can, right? Now, I don't know about you guys. I, I, you had that visualization of we're going to be sitting there, we're going to be typing in all these MAC addresses, and we're going to be typing in all these port profiles, and we can definitely do that, right? Or the other thing which we can do is vCenter 5.0 or above, right? We can just basically point the switch to vCenter, and it will go out there, and based on when that, when that VM is created, that VM gets associated with the network policy. That network policy is a one-to-one -one map to a port profile on the switches, mm -hmm. right? What's going to happen is when I bring up that VLAN, create a VLAN here, I'm going to, that VLAN is automatically, going, A, going to be created, B, it's going to get dragged over to that switch, right, and assigned to that port, and then as that VM moves, things are just going to naturally follow it, all right? It's, it's a simple solution. Um, works quite nicely. Another one that we have here is what happens if a link between a host and a switch goes down. Well, I'm assuming here that we've got these, you know, lags, these V lags going on between the host and the switches, right? Right? So I'm running along here, let's say for the sake of argument, that link goes down. What happens? Really not much, right? <laughs> right? All we did was we lost that link, so that MAC address no longer lives on that switch. So all the traffic to that MAC address is now going to go to the other switch. And reality is it's a lag, so I probably didn't lose all that much performance anyways. Okay. Um, what happens if we lose a network link, right? Theoretically, not much, right? That link, that link loss is detected by the switches involved, right? That, that gets propagated through the rest of the fabric to everybody else in the fabric, right? Just through the simple link state update. And the end result is we manage to route around that within a, you know, maybe a, maybe a few hundred milliseconds at absolutely worst case, right? Um, Switch level? Well, if the switch goes down, we're basically getting a combination of the same things, right? All I did was I lost a couple of network links, I lost a, a, an edge link, but really, you know, okay, the LSA is bigger, but you know, really there's not a whole lot different happening here. 
Okay. Where it gets interesting is it gets interesting in the case where I have multiple data centers. Right? Here is a case where I've got a couple of different a couple of different data centers that are tied together. Now, there's two sides to this, right? One side is how do I make sure that I can v-motion between the two data centers, right? Because theoretically, if that water starts flowing through the sprinkler system and we kill all the power to one of our data centers, right? Theoretically, everybody's going to v-motion over that other data center and everything's going to come back to life. Make sense? Right? Well, that's right now. We'll talk about some other things that we can do here in a little bit. There's really two criteria that have to happen here, right? One is I've got to make sure that layer two is dragged between the two data centers. I've got to set the same layer two domain span the two data centers, right? And then number two is, is I need to make sure those two data centers are within five milliseconds of each other, right? So we're kind of governed by the speed of light. I can't have one of them in New York and the other one in Tokyo, sorry. Um, but I can, you know, I can go metro distances is pretty easily, if that makes sense. Um, that's one side of it. The other side of this though, is, is the whole front door, back door thing, right? I'm gonna have two different entry points into my data center. If you think about it, it's like one big data center, but I've gotta have two different entry points into it. I've gotta have one over here on data center alpha, I've gotta have another one over here on data center bravo, and somehow or another, I've gotta figure out how do I make sure that, that traffic that was coming into alpha, in the event that alpha fails, goes over to bravo, right? The solution here, I, I want to introduce you guys to a little product here called the ServerIron ADX, right? And what the ADX is, is everybody in the world calls it a load balancer. Um, people at Brocade like to call it an application delivery switch. What's the distinction between the two? Well, it does a little bit more than just load balancing, right? Um, actually, it does a lot more than just load balancing. And, and a lot of the features it have are focused around high availability. The idea being that these guys will actually work with each other to it, both have the IP addresses be able to float between the two, two boxes in an active active type of, manu type of means, that, that we're gonna be able to advertise the prefixes appropriately based on network availability. We can even go in there through things like global server load balancing and actually manipulate DNS record ever, you know, responses, DNS responses, to make sure that traffic is always coming to the closest data center. But in the event that one of these data centers, so here I have my situation here, right? I've got my two load balancers sitting, at the, sitting you know, in, in the path. If one of those load balancers goes away, i.e. the whole data center shut down because something caught fire or somebody did a sprinkler flow test, right? The other data center stays alive. The IP addresses go over, the prefix advertisements go over, this whole thing stays alive, right? The user's not aware of the fact that the traffic used to be going over to Alpha, now it's going over to Bravo. That kind of makes sense. Okay. This kind of makes sense? Service scalability. This is exciting stuff, right? Um, the whole idea behind virtual, I don't know if it's a whole idea, but one of the big ideas behind virtualization was we're gonna save money, right? And the way we're gonna save money is because we're gonna need fewer resources, and so we're gonna burn less electricity powering those resources. And so we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna use um, you know, less air conditioning to cool those resources. We're gonna need less floor space in the colo to rent for these resources. We're, I don't know, we're all gonna be rolling in money, right? Um, you guys see the New York Times op-ed a little while ago? It was a complaint about the fact that something like 80%, I, I'm, I can't remember the number off the top of my head, but it was a rather large percentage of re resources in data centers. It's talking about how data centers are consuming more, um, you know, more electricity and more you know, energy than they really should be because most of what's going on inside of data centers isn't being used. It's just pre-provision for, um, pre for just in case, all right? This, it's still going on even in the virtualized day, right? Because let's be realistic, provisioning just enough resources in my virtualized environment would be easy if my demand was always consistent, right? It's not easy when my demand is continually changing, okay? So the question comes up is say, here we are, we're, you know, we're, we're either an IT department or a service provider, we need to just barely meet the criteria, you know, barely meet the demand of our customer. 
right? If we way overkill, that's not good. If we come up short, that's not so good. I'll give you a little example, right? Say for the sake of argument, I've got my nice little seasonal business, right? I run pretty good business most of the year. But what happens is, towards the end of the year, Christmas comes around, right? And all of a sudden, I start selling a lot of stuff, right? And even in the January, I'm still a little bit busy because I've got all those returns on the back end, right? And this manifests itself from my perspective, not just as business, but it also manifests itself as how busy are my servers, right? Let's say I'm an online business and then my website's getting hammered, okay? How many, how, much, how many resources do I provision? Well, I can take the low ball approach and kind of say, well, this is going to meet, me, meet my demand most of the time, right? Ten, mon ten months out of the year, I'm good. Obviously, that's, you know, the sea level people are not going to be very happy with you come, come rush season, right? I could turn around and do what most people have really been doing historically, and I can provision for worst case, right? And, and probably even provision for worst case plus, which means that I got a whole lot of unused. This is where that, you know, 80% or so of unused resources come from. Or in an ideal world, I'd do that, right? I would provision things appropriately. Now, this is the kind of chart that makes every CEO smile. And this is the kind of chart that makes every engineer in the world hate me, <laughs> right? Because it's really easy to look at that and go, that would be cool. It's really kind of a challenge to say, well, okay, I notice you don't have any labels on that vertical axis there, Mr. Montgomery. <laughs> um, what are we gonna do about that? And the, and, and the answer is actually, we just need to define how do we measure this? How do we measure the amount of resources that we have available? And how do we measure how hard we're hitting those resources? Okay, and I'm gonna propose this as a methodology, right? We'll start with the resources. To measure resources, if you think about it, each VM, VMs are our unit of currency here, right? Each VM is going to be pretty much the same. It's probably going to have the same amount of disk. It's going to have the same amount of network. It's going to have the same amount of memory. It's going to have the same CPU. It's going to have, right? And so we can measure our capacity by measuring the number of VMs that we have. As far as our demand goes, demand's a little different, right? Because CPU utilization isn't really a great measure of demand. Um, Memory utilization isn't necessarily a great measure of demand. What is a great measure of demand, especially in this type of environment that we're talking about, right, is response time. How fast are we servicing those, those, those requests from the customers, right? When the customer goes in there to order, what, is their, what, what does their experience look like? Or how fast is the replication happening? Or how fast, you know, how fast is traffic flowing across the network? And so the idea is, is that what we can do, let's go back to this guy, right? has a little feature down here called the Application Resource Broker. And what ARB does is the server iron, obviously for this to work, we have to have a load balanced application. So obviously the application has to be load balancer friendly, right? But what we're gonna do is we're gonna have a certain number of VMs living inside, you know, running our applications here, okay? And that server iron is gonna be in the data path and it's gonna be watching the traffic flow, it's gonna be measuring the traffic flow, and it's gonna be getting real-time information on how fast these servers are responding to the requests, right? And there's gonna be thresholds. As that response time starts getting slower and slower and slower, as things get busy, it's gonna be talking to the application resource broker plugin that runs on vSphere, right? And it's gonna say, hey, we are gonna need another VM here, right? And two, two things can happen. One thing is it can actually notify network management, and say, hey guys, might be time to spin up another VM, or if you trust it enough, you can actually have it go out there and actually work through vCenter to actually spin up the new VM on its own, add that VM to the server pool, and actually govern its own resources, okay? Likewise, as that response time starts to come down, when it goes down below a falling threshold, we can say, okay, let's go ahead and deprovision. This is gonna be huge when you, you know, people are out there renting VM time, right? I can pull, scale back the number of VMs that I have deployed and hopefully keep my, you know, keep, keep my network or my VM bill under control. Yeah, it's controlled at the load balancer? Hmm? That's controlled at the load balancer? Right. Okay. Kind of neat. Okay. Multi-tenancy. Any questions so far? Am I I'm kind of blasting through this? Multi-tenancy is another issue that we need to think about, right? How do we take, and it, and it kind of comes down to two things, right? How do I make this system scalable so that, you know, we talked earl earlier a little bit about zones, I think, right? If I've got, I've got an op option here. Um, I'm building out, you know, I'm building out Rob's 
Rob Server Company. I'm renting VMs, right? VMs by the hour. So do I want to have one big data center? And I put that in quotes, right? It could be multiple physical facilities, but one big, uh, I hate to say it, but one big cloud full of hosts, right? And I can put a VM here and I can put a VM there and VMs everywhere, right? Or do I want to divide it up into sections, right? And those sections each, so a client would have to have all their VMs in one, in a single section, right? Now, the, every engineer in the room is going, sections sound good, <laughs> right? Keep nice bounded size of everything. Everything's nice and easy to maintain, right? Every business person in the room is probably going, one big happy, I want the, the easiest possible, you know, deployment strategy. Put it anywhere, right? And there's obviously always going to be a balancing act between those two. What we're looking for, though, is how do we, without sacrificing control, how do we make that section, that zone, as big as humanly possible? Okay? What we need to do is we need to do two things. The first thing we need to do is we need to drag layer two all the way across this network. Right? And I, I, I'm, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here. So going back to that previous slide. So scalability is big. Scalability means how big can I make that layer two domain? Right? But I also need security. I need to segment that traffic. Right? If I got Coke and Pepsi on the same VM, or not on the same VM, on the same host, right? how do I make sure that those two VMs are separated enough? And the easy way to do that right, is historically, you put them on a VLAN, you put a firewall between them. Obviously, there's a security side of the host. right? Um, that's about all I need to worry about. Right? Operationally, that gets difficult. And the reason why that gets difficult is because of a VLAN, specifically the VLAN tag, right? The VLAN tag only scales to 4,096 VLANs. So I just, by default, I just limited myself to a maximum number of customers of 4,096 within one layer two domain, right? And really, it's going to be a little bit lower because I know that I'm going to be using some VLANs for other stuff, right? So, okay, we'll call it 4,000 4, customers. That's not very big, right? The other thing is, is I'm st still limited to dragging that layer two domain. That layer two domain is always going to give me an <coughs> upper bound of how big I can make that, make that network, right? What if I could figure out a way to route that network while still pr making it appear to the VMs as if they're in the same layer two domain? And what would happen if I then made the size of that VLAN tag a whole lot bigger? And that's what the whole concept of VXLAN is, right? VXLAN is basically it's a replacement for that VLAN tag, but what it does is it hides behind the IP header. It's actually inside of, it also hides behind a UDP header that I didn't draw here, right? And what it does is twofold. One, it allows you to essentially tunnel these VLANs across a layer three domain. So the only things in that layer two domain are going to be the VMs for that particular, for that particular tenant, right? The second thing that it does is it increases the size of that, that tag. Instead of being 4096, I've got 24 bits to play with, and that gives me over six, almost 17 million possible customers, or almost 17 million possible tag value. Obviously, you know, a customer could have multiple tag values. Right? But it's a much more scalable, much bigger zone type of configuration. Okay? Um, so the, the little problem we run here, right? I've got my VLAN land, which is where all my customers live, right? Well, they're not talking VXLAN. There's, if I send a VXLAN frame to your laptop, is it going to know what I'm talking about? You know, Bitbucket is a good place to go, right? Um, and then I have this you know, multi tenant data center environment. Right, where I'm running VXLAN. Somehow or another, I need to get from A to B, and I need to do so in a way that is secure, right? that allows for segmentation. And the solution's this guy again. Remember him? Right? One of the things, and this is, I talked about the forward-looking stuff earlier. This is something that we're in the process of rolling out, is the idea of taking these ADXs and you put them between the customer and you know, the, the multi-tenant infrastructure. And the idea is, is inside of each one of these ADXs, it's, it's a multiprocessor and architecture. And what it allows me to do is it allows me to actually segment in a secure manner to translate between a customer's VLAN scheme and the VXLAN scheme that's running inside of, the, inside of that data center, right? And it does so in a way that separates the control so that we're not, you know, potentially exposing ourselves to, you know, to security issues. All right? Makes sense? 
Questions? And then the final thing here is service velocity. Now, like we mentioned, service velocity is how fast can I turn up services, right? We've been talking to a lot of different organizations out there. We're seeing that depending on who you talk to, kind of the average time it takes to turn up a service from the time that somebody requests a VM to the time that it goes through the network provisioning and the storage provisioning and the compute provisioning and so on and so forth, it's encroaching on about 45 days, right? That's rather a long time. Um, especially if you're doing this for profit, you want it to be a little bit faster, right? There's a number of companies out there that have a great interest in making this faster because the faster they can get a provision, the faster they can send the invoice, the faster they get paid. And one of those companies happens to be a little outfit called Rackspace, right? And what Rackspace has done, well, first of all, let's talk quickly about some of the uh, different types of service provisioning that we, well, we've talked about most of this stuff actually, right? Administrative moves. If I need to move that VM either for capacity planning or in order to you know, make room for a maintenance window or something along those lines, right? That's pretty easy to do from the back end, right? That's just like a V motion move. Um, we already talked about AMPP, which takes care of the network side of that, right? Emergency moves, response to a failure, right? If a data center goes down or a host goes down or you know, something along those lines, obviously, you know, there's still some outage incurred with that, but it's very, very brief. Um, and again, AMPP will take care of that as well, right? Um, capacity adjustments. If I need to spin up VMs or tear down VMs dynamically as, you know, as part of capacity planning that we talked about, we've already talked about the application resource broker and how we can do that through there. Um, where we get into it is through more of a new service turnup, i.e. the customer making the request of that provider saying, hey, I need a new VM, right? Historically, that's a phone call. Maybe it's a web session if you're lucky. Um, we, and then, then, then that starts the whole facilitation process of putting all that stuff together. What Rackspace did was Rackspace has started, and, and they've actually, this is now an open source project that was founded there, but it's actually, you know, a lot of vendors are involved in this, Brocade's involved in this. Um, it's doing a great job of saying, how do we come up with a management hierarchy which allows us to dynamically provision these services, or I should say rapidly provision these services and automatically provision these services based on customer requests, right? And so what OpenStack is, is if you think about it, inside of my data center, I really have three different types of resources, right? I've got my compute, that's where my VMs live, right? Obviously that compute needs to have storage, so I've got my storage resources. And then from our point of view, because we're network guys, right? We're interested in the network resources. What OpenStack does is it builds the API tie-ins into all of this stuff. Right? And it's actually a piece of software. It's an open source piece of software. You can, I think, what is it, openstack.org or something along those lines. Um, and what you can do is you can actually go ahead and use the OpenStack controller to, with supporting, with, you know, supporting equipment, go ahead and actually go do that, those, that provisioning. That then has the northbound interfaces to deal with things like a web front end. You know, right? Anybody here ever host a website on like a commercial web hosting company? No, you didn't? you're familiar with cPanel, mm -hmm. right? The whole idea here is that I go into my cPanel site, right? And I can go ahead and I, I, I use, a, I, it doesn't use cPanel, but something very similar. I can register domain names, I can do this, I can do that, I can- Install applications. Right, install applications, I can do all kinds of good stuff, right? Fantastic. Uh, you, you, you must use DreamHost. Um, what they do, right, it's, it's, it, it's and it, what I do is I, I, I fire up that web hosting and guess what? They're sending me the bill within hours, mm -hmm. right? It's extremely efficient. Well, the idea is we want to be able to do the same thing where a customer goes into that web portal, orders the server, the server spins up, and life is good, right? Tie that into billing. We, it's, it's an open source, rather extensible system. We could tie that into all kinds of other stuff as well, right? Um, and so that's kind of the direction that we're going. And Brocade is a part of that. Um, obviously, there's a lot of people involved in that, in, that, in that process, but we see this as being very, very fundamental to, uh, you know, to the new large things. And you, people, we're seeing OpenStack not just deployed commercially as like the, the infrastructure as a service, we're also seeing it deployed in large corporations where people, you know, you take like Brocade, an engineer may need a VM to do something, right? This would be a way for them to spin it up and drop it down um, on demand.
So, does that make sense? I know I kind of this is kind of a fire hose. Um, questions, comments, complaints. What was Brocade's motivation for expanding out of the fiber fabric market to here? I think it's probably a couple of things, um, and, and, and and I wasn't around when the when the decision was made, so you know I might get this a little bit wrong. They um, didn't consult you? No, they, they they never gave me a call. Um, but no, but what, I think I think what it is is a couple of things. I mean, obviously there's the growth model, right? Looking at networking, how is storage networking growing? Where is storage going, right? And we're seeing a lot of, ins you know, a, a lot of new territory involved in like iSCSI and NAS and things along those lines. Um, there's probably some, some things going on there. Obviously, FCOE is a large part of it, right? Obviously, there's, you look for ways in which, how do, you, how do I grow my company? What's the logical extension of how do I grow my company? And if you're a networking company, it makes sense to expand into all of networking. You know, um, honestly, I, I had to make a decision between going to 8-gig fiber channel mm -hmm. or 10-gig iSCSI right. and for the cost. Right, and, and, and it's kind of one of these things is the industry is changing. Yeah. Your choice is that you can either lead, <laughs> right, or you can yeah, get left behind. Wayside, yeah. and, uh, and so that's kind of, that's, I think that was really the motivation. Thanks. And it's been great. It's, I mean, I think it's been fantastic. So. So. Appreciate your time. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Thank you.